Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24, France 24's tech show. In this edition, we take a look at how technology is helping save and sometimes revive species that are going extinct. From innovative biodiversity monitoring systems to AI facial recognition, genome sequencing and cryoconservation, we shed light on some of the most fascinating techniques developed for wildlife conservation. And Test24 will stay somewhat within the animal kingdom and take a look at the Metafly, a robot that matches the flying elegance and gliding abilities of insects. But first, artificial intelligence is progressing in several domains, including those linked to human interactions. Robots can smile, frown, laugh and cry. They can even show signs of empathy, intellectual engagement and independent thought. But machines do have some shortcomings in terms of social skills. While they may be able to tell jokes, they probably do not understand them, making humor one area where robots and humans simply don't compare. Erin Ogunkia explains. Thank you for inviting me. For those who fear the intelligence of robots may one day surpass that of humans, rest assured, there is at least one area where people still have a leg up, humor. Experts, including comedian Curtis Matthews, say understanding what makes people laugh is one thing that still separates humans from artificial intelligence. I'm not worried that a robot will take my job as a comedian because uh, my comedy is as personal as my thumbprint. You could get AI to repeat the jokes that I write and or the things that I feel, but you could never get AI to become me. You just can't. So, you know, because of the, my experience as a human being, you can't put AI through the same, you know, 50 plus years of, of experience on this planet and heartbreak and sadness and funny and good stuff too. Life experience is key. Humor relies entirely on real-world observations, context, background, and even common sense, subtle yet complex components that machines cannot consider. Still, some computers can already generate and understand puns, the most elementary form of humor and a basic skill many academics are trying to build on. To that effect, computer scientist Heather Knight created the comedy-performing robot Ginger, to better understand how robots and humans interact with and respond to each other. And she insists computers are less one-dimensional than some would think. When I started doing robot comedy, I just thought the robots would just deliver a one-liner and a punchline. Um, I didn't realize how much um, uh, of individual character my robots would actually have. Knight does, however, admit people are still much better at determining what's funny than machines. So for now, people concerned robots will inevitably take their jobs, should perhaps try their hand at stand-up comedy. Why did the scarecrow keep getting promoted? Because he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Biodiversity loss is the local reduction or extinction of species in a certain habitat. And according to the UN, it's a silent killer that could lead to the end of mankind altogether. But many scientists around the world are fighting back using technology, and one of them is Sarab Seti, a third-year PhD student at Imperial College in London, who's working on a completely automated biodiversity surveying system. Well, let's cross over in London to Sarab Seti. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Julia. So first for our viewers, could you tell us why it is so important to monitor biodiversity? Um... So we're monitoring biodiversity in tropical forests and the, these forests are complex systems. Everything relies on everything else. So the biodiversity helps the trees to grow and the soil to maintain its right conditions. And also sort of the forest acts as a carbon sink in certain situations, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And all of this is sort of tied into our food production around the world, whether you're in a tropical forest or not. So we want to understand how biodiversity in these very high, high, highly biodiverse regions is being affected by land use and changes, but also how that will also affect the rest of the world and our day-to-day -day lives. Now, some are calling your research project the Shazam of Species. Could you tell us more about it and what technologies you have chosen to use to conduct your research? 
Yeah, so the Shazam for species is we're actually monitoring the acoustics of the rainforest. So listening for the birds calling, frogs calling, insects, everything, mammals, gibbons. So what we're doing is we're putting out, a, we've designed our own sensors, which are essentially a small computer called Raspberry Pi attached to a 3G dongle and a solar panel that records audio continuously from the forest and uploads it to the internet. So we leave these out for long time periods and we are receiving real time feeds of audio. And then using that, we're trying to pull out information such as which birds are calling, but also more general metrics such as how active the soundscape is to see how the biodiversity is changing within our forest. Now tell us more about the kind of insight you're looking for to gain from this autonomous biodiversity surveying technique. So people have looked at biodiversity for ages and have different ways of monitoring this, but our method is very amenable to fully automating from data collection for our sensors that sit out and continue to load the data and our analysis methods that automate, like use machine learning techniques to analyze the data. So doing such a scalable approach will allow us to put more sensors at a very high spatial scale and also leave them over very long time periods to get a fully continuous picture of how the biodiversity is changing in our different land use types in our forest. That might inform better policy for creating and maintaining more sustainable oil palm production, as we know the true effect of the interface between oil palm or timber production and our tropical forests. Sarah Bsetti from the very inspiring Safe Acoustic Project, thank you for speaking to us. No problem, thank you. Now to dig a little bit deeper into the subject, let's now welcome our in-house expert Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello Dan, you're going to tell us more about a project to monitor primates population this time and it's called PrimeNet and it was developed by the Michigan State University in the U.S. That's right, PrimeNet was developed by using neural networks. These neural networks were trained with a data set of thousands of images of these primates so that it could identify each individual animal. Now, in order to make the use of PrimeNet uh, easier, the uh, team of scientists also developed a companion app called Prime ID. It's uh, an Android app. So using that Prime ID, all you have to do is take picture of uh, one of these three primates, drop it in the app, and the app will do the rest. It will identify uh, the individual animal. Now, this is useful, first of all, in order to keep track of the animal so as to get an estimate of the population. And secondly, it also is helpful in combating poaching and trafficking. Now, another interesting wildlife conservation technique that's being used in many zoos now around the world is uh, cryoconservation. The idea is to, help to keep and freeze and store some of these cells of these animals to be able to save them if one day they go extinct. That's right. Uh, there's a facility at San Diego Zoo's Institute of Conservation Research. It's called Frozen Zoo. And as the name suggests, it consists of thousands of living uh, cell cultures, sperms, oocytes, and even embryos that are stored at a temperature of minus 180 degrees. Now, one of the most interesting projects of uh, this facility relates to the revival of the northern white rhino species, which is very close to extinction. In fact, there are only two animals living on our planet, uh, two northern white rhinos surviving. Uh, scientists are hoping to make use of recent advances in stem cell technologies, particularly turning skin cells into induced pluripotent stem cells so that they can be further transformed into sperms and eggs and they can be fused together to create embryos. We often talk about gene sequencing for humans, but now it's actually being applied for animals and to save a very cute animal, the koala. Well, that's right. Multiple factors like urbanization, climate change, uh, widespread disease have made koala a vulnerable species. And one way to combat uh, the dwindling numbers of koala is to understand uh, the genome of this animal. And for that, uh, researchers in Australia have sequenced the genome in order to better understand the mechanism of the immune system. Because these animals are vulnerable to diseases, to uh, get an idea of how their immune system works will allow our researchers to develop better vaccines in order to combat uh, these problems. Thank you, Dan. We're going to move on to test 24. going to keep on bringing to life creatures and this time we're not using genome sequencing but just a simple remote control Dan. That's right this is a flying object a flying robot called Metafly and it mimics the uh, flight of an insect 
This has been developed by a French inventor called Edwin van Rombeek, who is based in Marseille. Now you can see this is an evolution of uh, a flying robot because there are multiple in, uh, innovations in this uh, particular device. So for example, here you have these ultra thin wings made of a special polymer. They, the width of this uh, polymer is only 20 microns. The entire uh, robot, it weighs less than 10 grams. It's very which, light, it's yeah, beautiful. It makes it more agile, it makes right. it more fast. And you can control the flight in multiple ways. For example, if you want it to fly fast, you just have to uh, lower the tail and it goes at 20 kilometers per hour. And if you uh, raise it, it will slow, slow it down. down to five kilometers an hour, which is ideal for uh, interior locations like our studio. So let's try and see how it flies. As you can see, it's very, it's very agile. It, it is it's very, very sharp agile. Turns. It goes fast. And it's very elegant as well. It seems like an insect, right? And I think this is a great example of <laughs> We're biomimicry. being attacked. Uh, Someone is actually controlling the, the robot. Yeah. And uh, so uh, right now, it's, this is just the first product. Uh, right now, it can fly for eight minutes. That's his autonomy. But uh, Edwin is hoping that this will grow into something big and it can ultimately uh, be able to replace uh, the drones which create a lot of no noise uh, compared to such uh, devices which are very silent and they can glide with by making no noise at all. So there are multiple advantages uh, to this particular design and of course the mechanism of uh, the wing flaps. A marvelous creature indeed. Thank you so much, Dan. And of course, Edwin, uh, we'd like to thank him as well. He was backstage controlling the robot for us. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time.